You'll take luxury vacations anytime you want for free. Print edible cheeseburgers at the touch of a button and watch TVs that feel as real as life itself. Technology is pushing from every direction. Getting faster with each passing second. Prepare yourself. The future is closer than you think. In the coming decades, we'll see an explosion of new ways to entertain ourselves with interactive experiences. Our first encounter with the future of fun will come when we watch movies and television. We're going to see more and more immersive technology allowing us to become wrapped up in the storyline. And it will start with the actors. In the future, we'll be creating digital movie stars. Animator Jeff Kleiser calls them synthespians, computer-generated characters as lifelike as any real flesh-and-bones actor. Synthespians won't demand huge salaries. They'll work around the clock without threatening to call their agents. And they'll be able to do things most actors can't. Once you've achieved that total realism, the sky's really the limit. But in order to get a computer-generated character to deliver an award-winning emotional performance, animators have to overcome an obstacle, creating realistic facial features. So, you think I'm just another pretty face? At Image Metrics, they've decided that the secret to recreating human emotions on a computer face is to capture the performances of real actors. They've been perfecting a way to create a flawless animated copy of any facial expression. While an actress holds a certain look for just a few seconds, an array of cameras takes hundreds of photos from hundreds of angles under thousands of different lighting conditions. Animators use the resulting images to create a full three-dimensional computer-generated face. Oh, wow, look at that. The end result is so lifelike and so real that you don't even know that you're looking at an artificially created character. Peter Bush heads up the production team that animates these hyper-realistic computer faces. But he's not trying to put actors out of work. In fact, he thinks this approach will give actors far more opportunities to stretch their character range. Actors, they can play themselves younger, they can play themselves older. Using this technique, animators can graft an actor's unique interpretation of a sentence onto virtually any animated body. You could film me, and then I could suddenly look like a female, a young female, or I could look like a nerdy cartoon guy, or even a uh, bald old man. It's really the ultimate tool for any actor or an actress because they, they're never limited. They always are, are free to do what they've always done best. Once perfected, this technology will allow actors' careers to last forever, even after they die. We will be able to recreate stars from the past. There will be those people that will want to see Heath Ledger and Marilyn Monroe working together or bring back the Beatles for a performance. And these digital doubles will be rendered in perfect 3D, making it impossible to tell what was filmed with a camera and what was generated on a computer. The rate of acceleration of this technology is truly mind-boggling. You would not be able to differentiate that performance from a filmed performance of a human being. And the sense of reality will be enhanced by another innovation coming to the world of entertainment. Live actors and synthespians will soon burst right into your living room because television will be three-dimensional. Once you've seen 3D TV, you've seen the future and you won't go back. Traditional 3D movies mimic the way our eyes see by using two side-by-side -side cameras to shoot an image. The two images are then projected on top of each other, but slightly offset. Special glasses let the right eye see one image and the left eye see the other. Your brain perceives this as depth. To see 3D like a natural life, you see a slightly different image from each eye, and your brain compiles that into a 3D image experience. 
but Philips figured out a way to build this effect right onto the screen itself. No goofy glasses required. How does it work? The television software calculates the difference between what your left eye and right eye should see for any given frame of video. And then, millions of tiny prisms on the plasma screen project multiple versions of each pixel to your eyes. Once your brain puts the variations together, a 3D image pops right off the screen, totally changing the experience of watching television. It's really immersive. It's really like you're in the natural life. You feel the content. What makes it truly revolutionary is that this technology takes any 2D image and projects it in 3D. So it can be photos, or it can be video, or movies, or gaming even. And eventually, 3D entertainment won't even need a screen. Movies and television will be displayed in thin air. That's exactly what the inventors of the fog screen are working toward. The fog screen is an immaterial display technology that allows you to project computer-generated images onto thin sheets of fog. Yes, fog. As unlikely as it sounds, a team of virtual reality pioneers from Finland has developed a technology that projects video onto a fine vapor. The result? A floating image you can walk around or even through. It's the first step in creating a fully immersive simulated reality room, or holodeck. The holodeck is a concept from science fiction. It is a virtual environment that appears completely physical and shows you 3D objects that you can walk around in as if it were the physical world. Fog makes for an ideal 3D projection screen, a layered surface capable of reflecting light without actually having a solid presence. The system creates a half-inch curtain of extremely small droplets of water vapor, so small, in fact, that you can barely even feel it. It feels dry to my touch because it's a water so thinly dispersed in air. The secret of the system lies in how it creates the unusual fog. Regular tap water sits in an overhead tank. Then ultrasonic waves blast the water into minuscule drops. Carefully placed fans then force the droplets into a smooth curtain. Once you layer several of these fog curtains together, you can project a 3D image onto them that appears to hover in mid-air. We have an object projected onto the front and then a coordinated image projected on the back so that to the observer it actually appears as one 3D volumetric object. This low-resolution fog screen provides a first glimpse of a future world without screens. And as the team develops ways to create even smaller droplets of water, the fog will become seamless, creating a far more realistic image. Imagine a fog screen in your home where movable sheets of fog project your favorite night spot around you at the press of a button. Or you might even take projected 3D phone calls. You can invite remote participants into your living room just by having a 3D appearance of them being displayed on these sheets of fog. And when you're done having fun, the entire illusion will disappear into thin air. Technology may turn movies into full-sized audio-visual hallucinations, but video games will transform from something you see and hear into something you can feel. People will be able to adjust the feeling of a punch or a feeling of a karate chop on their body, just like the volume control on a TV. The acceleration of computing speed and power has transformed video games into entire virtual worlds that are more lifelike and interactive than ever. And in the future, we'll be logging on to these playgrounds of limitless opportunity more and more. We'll be spending, in fact, most of our time in these virtual environments because they'll be just as realistic as real reality, but a lot more exciting. My dream is to be able to step inside the games and have them be indistinguishable from reality. 
but no matter how fun it is to blast and slash your way through today's games, the experience never quite crosses the border into feeling real, because you never quite feel anything. The missing aspect is that physical aspect. Our body is moving and our body is experiencing and feeling. It's not the same as reality. High definition graphics and digital surround sound have pushed the sights and sounds of video game play to new limits. You look like you could use a drink, stranger. But video games have barely begun to explore our other senses. Adrian Chiak is working on ways that will allow us to actually feel the virtual environments of video games through haptics, software programs that recreate physical sensations. In the future, we're going to have radical new forms of both communication and entertainment and play using such haptic technology. Haptics are just starting to appear in real-world applications. Bomb squads will use haptic-controlled robots to get a better grip on potential explosives. Athletes will use haptic training devices, like this whitewater rafting simulator that transmits the push and pull of a virtual raging river through the ore itself. The way most people will first experience the sensation of virtual touch will be through the next generation of video games, using versatile haptic suits. So here we have the haptic suit, and we have these special airbags which are placed inside the material. And these are controlled by uh, special pumps and vacuum devices. By inflating and deflating these small pockets of air inside the suit, a computer program can make you feel pressure on specific points on your body. So you'll truly experience a roundhouse kick in the ribs while playing a martial arts video game. As the technology develops, the gaming experience will be far more intense than anything we've encountered in our living rooms. In the future, you'll be able to have new kinds of fighting and martial arts experiences, which are completely realistic. And if testing how tough you are exceeds your pain limits, well, you can always dial down the action a notch. People will be able to adjust the feeling of a punch or a feeling of a karate chop from their body, just like the volume control on a TV. In the future, haptic technology will spring up in all sorts of fun ways, from virtual bungee jumps to virtual battlefields. Your body will be able to feel what's happening around you without any actual risk to life and limb. You'll really feel those actions on your body as if you're really there. It's not just a game that you're playing with a controller. Climbing Mount Everest. I can't do that now. But in the future, I'll really be able to experience that, even if in the real world it'd be impossible. Video games and virtual worlds will become complete sensory experiences, literally feeling more real. They'll seem even more real because you won't need to carry a joystick. You'll be able to control your virtual game environment directly from your mind with new devices like the Epic headset from Emotive. We'll be able to use our brain and our facial expressions to really experience content in entirely new ways. Every thought, every emotion we have gives off a unique electrical signal. The Emotive wireless headset has 16 independent sensors that can actually pick up these electrical brain signals from the surface of the scalp. And identify a signature for a particular thought or a particular emotion. And then in real time, we classify those brain patterns. The pattern of these electrical signals can be digitally encoded and then transmitted wirelessly, allowing you to control your computer directly with your thoughts. The joystick is about to go the way of the rotary phone. With the headset, when you think any one of a specific menu of commands, it can be carried out on the screen. There are 13 individual detections. Push, pull, lift, drop, left, right, and then rotation in six different axes in a 3D environment. The system also lets you do some things in the virtual world you can't do in real life, like making things disappear with a mere thought. You just visualize an object vanishing. 
and then you see that translate in a virtual object. But the headset doesn't just transform thoughts into commands. By sensing specific electrical patterns in your brain, it can let the computer know whether or not you're actually having any fun. It observes your experiences. Excitement versus calmness, tension, frustration, engagement versus boredom. So future games will actually know when you're feeling excited or bored and react accordingly by speeding up the action, for example, or making the game more challenging. Content can be varied. Difficulty can also be adjusted. Music and sound can be varied on the fly to really allow the player to be taken through an emotional journey. As the technology improves, the headset will be able to read more sophisticated instructions directly from your brain. So when it comes to future game playing, keep an open mind. I think we're really only at the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's possible. The future promises wildly new kinds of entertainment. But how could technology improve on the simple pleasure of a good meal? After all, from the days of the caveman, cooking has been a pretty low-tech affair. Gather food, apply fire. But at their Chicago restaurant Moto, gastronomic visionary Homaru Kentu and his associate Ben Roche are preparing food with surprisingly high-tech flair. We use all sorts of unusual technologies here to explore food in more creative ways. If their kitchen resembles a lab, that's because Cantu and Roche approach food like experimental scientists. They call it molecular gastronomy, using the tools of science to isolate and recombine flavors and textures in startling new ways. Basically, food is made of the same building blocks. The only DNA difference between a tomato and an eggplant is a couple strands of RNA. What I'm going to do is create the core ingredients so that way you can eat whatever you want. Molecular gastronomy starts by using super freezing, superheating, and other techniques to turn ordinary food into powders, pastes, and gases. Instead of stoves and ovens, the process calls for less traditional kitchen appliances, like lasers. So we're just going to demonstrate the effectiveness of a class 4 laser at very low wattage. The light converts into a wavelength that's called the infrared wavelength. You can't see it. Once it hits that wavelength, it's going to burn the crap out of whatever's in front of it. And so he's going to incinerate that vanilla bean at 2800 degrees Fahrenheit thus creating a vanilla vapor. In this case, the powerful laser transforms the vanilla bean into a vapor, which is then reabsorbed by the wine poured into the glass, giving it an unexpected sweet note. By reworking food like this, Cantu can mix and match flavors and textures at will, turning beans into noodles and breads into pastes, combining them into surprising new dishes. We've got some cornbread right here, and we're just going to go ahead and plate up that cornbread. Nice little dollop of that, and then we're going to take some barbecue pork right there. Then we take some Boston baked beans. This kind of playful variety makes Cantu's cooking fun, but he's also experimenting with techniques which could make cooking virtually obsolete. After all, who needs to cook when you can print your meals on edible paper? Kantu uses a modified inkjet printer he calls his food replicator. He fills the print cartridges with food-based inks like juiced carrots and tomatoes. His replicator can then print the flavored images onto edible paper made of soybean and potato starch. In other words, if I take eight core ingredients that are found in a cheeseburger, then we take that printer and we hit cheeseburger. But printing meals onto edible paper is just the first step, as 3D printers become capable of creating actual solid objects layer by layer. Cantu sees a future where you'll be able to fabricate full meals at the touch of a button. Let's say that you send that home and you want the restaurant steak, but you don't want to go to that restaurant. You hit a button, 
it prints out a three-dimensional version of the steak that you would have had if you went there. You're receiving a digitally enhanced version of this steak. Our taste buds won't be the only sense opened up by new technologies. Listen up. In the future, music will not only sound different, it will look different as well. The reactable is a new concept in computer-based instruments. There are no keyboards, no turntables, just the high-tech manipulation of sound to create a totally new type of performance. Live performance is becoming more and more important since selling records is less and less important. We're starting to figure out how to make music with computers in real time. Physicist Sergi Jorda is one of the inventors of the reactable, which could change the way we think about how music is made. The transparent table acts like a synthesizer with a giant touchpad, translating colored objects into sounds. Cameras under the table track the position and orientation of objects on the surface. A computer processes the digital information and drives an array of pulsating lights. Every shape and movement produces a different tone, a different beat, a different effect. Turn a cube to one side to activate a specific sound filter. Rotate a disc to generate a modulator. Move them further or closer to one another to change the beat. This creates almost unlimited options for future musicians. When many pieces are on the surface, you have like 50 parameters that you can control at the same time. I mean, in the age of, of digital reproduction, why would someone would like to make things always the same? Jorda sees this new type of music as something that can constantly change and flow with its composer. Music that is immediate and participatory. I think the next years, maybe everyone will be able to consume and to make music at the same time, hopefully. Our gestures will not only control the music we make, they will control the world around us. Open doors, start the fireplace, turn down the lights. A new relationship between us and our machines is only a finger snap away. It's not the machine who's moving us, it's us moving the machine. Touchless technology will someday give us the ability to move objects in the physical world. But what we can do right now is control our computers hands-free. You can play video and music with an open palm, make a fist, and your hand becomes your computer's mouse. All of this from 10 feet away. I was first amazed to use this technology. It's actually moving without any touching. It felt like magic. Hand recognition integrates motion sensing technology with your computer video screen. Cameras recognize your hand movements and gestures as commands, and the computer responds. Haraki sees the technology fundamentally altering our connection to the things that improve the way we live, work, and especially play. In the future, we have many possibilities to spread this up technology. For example, like gaming or those kind of interfaces. Gesture recognition has the potential to make life simpler and certainly more fun. Play your favorite video game, jab and cut by gesture alone. Wave your hand to have your car drive up to your doorstep, ready to take you anywhere you need to go. And when you finally call it a night, a good night gesture to your home system will close the blinds and turn off the light. I can imagine a world um, full of gestures, me in the center, without touching anything, moving it as I want. In the future, we'll control our fun with thoughts and hand gestures. And we'll travel in all the luxury we've ever imagined. We will vacation in places we invent, encounter people we choose, and travel in whatever style we want. You can see and do things that you've never seen before, that you'll probably never see again. 
and that no one on earth would ever have seen. Philip Rosedale is the creator of Second Life, an internet-based 3D virtual world. Today, the internet is tens of thousands of computers connected together. But imagine if you took those computers and you had them actually simulate a real world, complete with weather and gravity. Well, that's Second Life. 15 million people consider themselves residents of this virtual universe. Up to half a million of them log on every day. When you download the software, you are given a virtual body. That digital character, called an avatar, is how you present yourself to the virtual world, and you can choose to create it either true to life or with any characteristics you want. Some of the whimsical choices that I made in creating my identity in Second Life are choices that show you something about me. You build a representation of yourself in the virtual world that is, in many ways, aspirational, sometimes a truer reflection of who you really are than even your real body. Through your avatar, you'll be able to visit all the destinations the virtual world has to offer. You would teleport into the location as you load. Objects will start to appear around you, buildings, sidewalks. You'll start to notice that there's other avatars that are also walking around. Sean Percival is a web designer who runs a virtual travel service. We'll actually take a group of maybe 10 to 20 avatars and we'll go tour some of these new locations. But to go on these tours, you won't need to go to an airport. You won't get jet lag. You won't even need to spend much money. Let's say that you travel kind of modestly and you stay at a rather bargain hotel. Well, in Second Life, everything is very cheap, so your avatar is literally living a luxurious life, maybe something a little bit more glamorous than normal life. And then there are the experiences that are only possible when vacationing in cyberspace. What if you wanted to go to Paris in the 1900s? In Second Life, you could actually travel back in time, something that you obviously can't do in the real world. Like flying or base jumping without a parachute. And as technology improves, this fantasy world won't feel so virtual. The experience itself will just get more and more interactive and more and more immersive. Various visors that you can wear, which really kind of tune you into the moment and help you block out everything else. There could be sensories like sound and smells and, and feelings that you can experience as well. But no matter how realistic your virtual life becomes, there are some things that just can't be digitized. If you take a virtual experience and there is no danger, there are no mosquito bites and no discomfort, then you really take away the keenest part of the equation, which is to push yourself to new territory and open your eyes to new things. Richard Bangs, co-founder of Mountain Travel Sobek, has led first descents of 35 different wild rivers, climbed the world's great peaks, and explored the jungles and deserts of all seven continents. He thinks the future will bring us real-world adventures even more thrilling than the virtual kind. Three, two... People want adventure, they want to push themselves, and they want risk. Because of emerging technologies, destinations once reserved only for hardcore explorers like Banks will become available to all of us. Especially when we know we'll never lose our way. GPS systems will be implanted in our clothing so that we can't get lost. New computer-assisted vehicles will also open up parts of the Earth that were impossible for civilians to visit before. There will be private submersibles that will allow you to go to depths that have not been experienced before. Like the Mariana Trench, which is 48,000 feet deep. There will be private hovercrafts that will allow you to seek out a wilderness patch of your own. And the world of adventure travel will come equipped with inventive, high-tech camping gear. Imagine a cushion of air below your tent so it doesn't matter how hard or rough the surface of the ground is. CEO Sam Solomon and his design team at Coleman are developing next-generation camping gear. Like tents that use hovercraft technology, taking air in and forcing it out through tiny jets on the bottom. When we make the tent hover, the entire camp room floor will be level and comfortable. 
Next-gen tents will give us our privacy while allowing us to feel more a part of any environment. One of the nice things about tents is that they protect you from the elements. The unfortunate thing, though, is it blocks your view of the outside world that you came to enjoy. A nice thing about one-way technology is you will be able to look out through the fabrics but still have the privacy of being inside. New fabric technologies will give explorers the freedom to wear the same clothing in any environment. The technology should be able to auto-adjust, so one lightweight garment should be able to protect you in a very, very extreme range of temperatures. And clothes may even produce their own power. Fabric will be made of microscopic fibers that rub against each other, creating minute amounts of electricity with millions of them sending currents to a collector. As we move or as our tents flap in the breeze, we'll be able to power our campground electronics. You can convert the mechanical energy of the day in your garments into electricity for use back at camp at night. To Richard Banks, advances like these are what will enable us to experience some of the most extreme and thrilling places on the planet new fabrics, new fibers, new technologies that will give you insulation and allow people to see and experience things that to this point have not been experienced or seen. But for those who get their thrills from competitive sports, the future promises some radical new ways to play and not just for humans. I believe that as macabre as it may sound, we'll be having some matches of fight to the death. Virtual and real-world vacations will certainly make your future fun. But when you're ready to raise the stakes, get ready for sports that will challenge you in brand new ways. Because to really have fun in the future, you'll want to take a few chances. We're a risk-taking nation, and people like to take risks. One man who's looking deep into the future of sports is Las Vegas oddsmaker Jimmy Vaccaro. He makes his living taking bets on every sport you can imagine. And now he's ready to gamble on some that haven't even been invented yet. Gambling in 20 years will be all virtual reality. You'll put yourself in different situations, whether it's racing a horse at Churchill Downs or playing in a Ryder Cup in England. You, the Kentucky Derby winner, you at the top of the stretch, there'll be nothing like it. Vaccaro is laying odds on a future in which your virtual self will compete against real athletes in a whole new category of sports. I believe you'll see a great menu explosion. Jet propulsion races, air races involving jet airplanes with the common people being the pilots. That's right. Place your bet and strap yourself in because soon you'll be going head to head against a real pilot in a real race all from the safety of your living room as part of the new Rocket Racing League. We're going to be able to let you race along live with the pilot. Fly side by side against the rocket racers in real time. Granger Whitelaw, who's developing this experimental new sport, is designing it from the ground up to allow amateur gamers to challenge pros for the first time ever. So one of the most exciting parts of rocket racing for me is the gaming component of it. At home on their computers, on their TVs, or on their iPhones or other PDAs they have. So while you bank and weave through a virtual course, live pilots are flying the real course at the same time. The line between spectator and participant will be obliterated. We want instant gratification in this country and we want to be entertained. I believe getting involved while things in real time are going on is absolutely the thing of the future. But Jimmy Vaccaro's not just betting on the Rocket Racing League. He's also planning for a future spectator sport that's an update of an old tradition. Remember the Colosseums in Rome a thousand years ago. We're tending to go more robotic in everything that we do. Robotic biting will be as big as jet propulsion racing. Vaccaro sees a new breed of gladiator taking to the ring. Autonomous humanoid robots. In a cross between robo-wars and mixed martial arts, 
These mechanical warriors will inflict a level of mayhem on one another that would be illegal for humans. I believe that, as macabre as it may sound, we'll be having some matches on fight to the death. In 30 years, trust me, I think we'll be betting on it. But the most far out sports may not be virtual or robotic. They may be in orbit. Zero gravity sports. Being able literally to push off with your toes and float through the air, grab a ball, do a flip, and throw it into the goal. Peter Diamandis imagines a future of outer space sports leagues and sports arenas. And as the founder of the Zero Gravity Corporation, he's been testing it out. By following a parabolic flight path, his converted 727 can create a zero-G environment for about 25 seconds at a time. Enough to get a feeling for what athletic activity might be like in space. Space, and particularly weightlessness, makes everybody have more hang time than the best NBA stars. Once you're free of the bonds of gravity, you're free to reinvent sports that have really a a very two-dimensional nature. Once you transplant regular sports like football into a weightless arena, they take on a whole new dimension. You've got the quarterback who throws the ball. The ball goes in one direction, they go tumbling backwards the other direction. The football players are gonna have to study the laws of physics to figure out how to play it properly. And as zero gravity games grow into a spectator sport, Diamandis foresees a future in which large floating arenas orbit the Earth. One of the fun parts about exploring space is reinventing the whole sporting industry. The spectator experience is going to be spectacular. Space sports may sound far-fetched, but future space tourism is coming. Faster than you think. Space tourism pioneer Richard Branson and his associates are working on it. Man's natural instinct is to explore, and we haven't even scratched the surface of exploration in space. By bringing in commercial space travel, I think enormous things are possible. His company, Virgin Galactic, is planning to create a fleet of spaceships that will take regular tourists up into space. The six passenger crafts will launch mid-air from a mothership and use a hybrid rocket motor to get some 68 miles up. But if these future space travelers are in no hurry to get back to Earth, someday they'll be able to book a room at the four-star Galactic Suites, the solar system's first space resort. Designed by former aerospace engineer Javier Claramunt, it will be a resort like nothing on Earth. A space station not for astronauts, but for tourists. And it will be in business sooner than you might think. El hotel uh, en principio está previsto que esté acabado e inaugurado al diciembre del 2012. Unlike most resorts, this one will require its guests to undergo eight weeks of physical and psychological training before they can go. After all, this is space we're talking about. Once you make it through the training, you'll get a chance to go on the ride of your life. A private rocket plane capable of accelerating up to 17,000 miles per hour after liftoff. They have one hell of a rush as they head off into space. And once you're in orbit 280 miles above the Earth, you'll finally get a good look at the small but ultra-exclusive Celestial Resort. The hub of the resort is the common area, and each arm is a lavish personal suite. Esta es la habitación privada. Aquí aparece el gran ojo que estaría siempre mirando hacia la Tierra. With Earth 280 miles away, you'll orbit the globe in only 80 minutes. That means 15 sunrises and sunsets every day. Besides the view, you'll experience something a select few ever will. Zero gravity. El turista tendrá una experiencia absolutamente flotando en ese interior en que no aparezca ninguna, ningún tipo de mobiliario que moleste. 
In case you get tired of bouncing around, you can always stick to the walls with the help of a Velcro suit. And if you're feeling cooped up, the hotel may also be able to offer a memorable day trip to the moon. Small spaceships, two-seated spaceships, so people could go off for day trips and they could be programmed to skim maybe 100 feet above the moon's surface and then come back to the hotel at night. While the experience promises to be exhilarating, make no mistake, acclimating to space will be challenging for any vacationer. Todas las actividades relacionadas con lo que es habitual vivir serán absolutamente nuevas. Desde cómo vamos a dormir, cómo vamos a comer. But it's precisely these challenges that will appeal to future space tourists. Of course, this particular adventure vacation won't come cheap. Claramont calculates that the typical three-day stay at Galactic Suites will set you back around $4 million. But prices will drop quickly as more and more people make the journey and larger orbiting resorts are built. I think that in 10 years' time, the price will come down dramatically. In 20 years' time, it'll come down even further and it'll continue to fall. Literally hundreds of thousands of people will have the chance of experiencing space. They'll come back fully qualified astronauts. They'll come back having seen the Earth and the beauty of the Earth. The future will be more entertaining than we can possibly imagine. It is where the virtual will become reality. We'll feel every punch and jab, control our world with our thoughts and gestures, Print our favorite food, take virtual vacations anywhere we like, and push our thrills over the edge. Are you ready for the fun to begin?